Hello there, I'm William, and with me today is Sean. Hello. And we'll be discussing the movie Glass. We'll be doing a review discussion of Glass. We'll start off without spoilers, and then go into spoilers at the end. So the newest M. Night Shyamalan film, Glass, which... I guess very minor spoiler, which there's no way that it's a spoiler if you know the movie exists, is that it's a follow-up to Unbreakable and Split. Um, so the 20, was it 2017 film from In Night Shyamalan, Split, had James McAvoy and Anya Taylor-Joy. And then Unbreakable was the movie from 2000 with Bruce Willis and Samuel L. Jackson. And so from, from Unbreakable to... Glass, there's been a 19 year gap. <laughs> I was Which, thinking about that. Like, man, that's like going, you know, that's not quite it, but close to uh, the first Star Wars in episode one. Like, that was 77 and 99. Like, yeah. you know, you're getting that territory, which was, it seemed like a long time we were kids. Now it's like, oh, yeah, I remember when Unbreakable came out. Well, or two, like, um, so Indiana Jones between The yeah. Last Crusade and Kingdom of the Crystal Skulls, yeah. what, like 89 and 2008. So, like, 19 years there. Yeah, it's insane. So, uh, big time gaps between these movies. And, yeah, so Unbreakable was M. Night Shyamalan's, like, second big movie. So, it was. Six Cents, Unbreakable, Signs, The Village, uh, then was it Lady in the Water, then The Happening, um, and I forget what he order. Did, he did Avatar, Avatar, and then that Will Smith, Willow Smith. After Earth. After Earth. Yeah, was, um, uh, Avatar, The Last Airbender, then After yeah. Earth was the only movie that he wasn't the sole writer of, I believe, that it was like there was a co-writer and Will Smith was credited too. <laughs> Um, and then that, that was dark times for Shyamalan. Yeah. So from like happening last air, air avatar, last airbender and, um, after earth, you know, he's kind of in director jail for a little bit after that. And then he did the visit, which was 2015, I think. Um, it sounds about I think right. So, Cause he did on our podcast and after the visit did well, then he did uh split which um, was a movie that was about James McAvoy was The Horde, um, or, you you know, he was a person with dissociative identity disorder. So he has a, was it 23 different personalities yeah. and he kidnapped some girls. And which, then, which they, you know, there's like, there's only, you know, maybe the dozen in the film and they, you know, yeah. they allude, allude it to, oh, the, you know, obviously there's more. We only saw like a dozen. So yeah. this film, we get to see a few more. And in that movie, at the end of it, as it concludes, you think the movie's over, and then you get kind of the, was it like pre-credits, or it was at the very end of the movie? Yeah, I don't think it was you, post-credits. You hear the theme from Unbreakable, or the music from Unbreakable, and you see David Dunn, the Bruce Willis character, sitting in um, like a restaurant or cafe or whatever, watching the TVs, like they're discussing what happened with the character of Kevin Crumb, Kevin Wendell Crumb, so... They kind of, at the very end, tie it back into this other movie. And it's interesting because Split was a universal movie and Unbreakable was a movie that M. Night Shyamalan made when he was still under Disney, a contract with them, a deal with them. So a lot of uh, business mumbo jumbo, but... And, and Blumhouse, too, had a hand in... Yeah, they produced um, his, those released Yeah, his relaunches, and I guess he was self-financed in he some ways, right? Self-financed, The Visit, Split, and Glass, which Glass so far, we're recording this on January 21st. It, you know, it's making good money. I think um, I just checked Box Off and Mojo has $40 million. Uh, yeah. Today's Martin Luther King Day, and it made like almost $7 million today. It's anticipated to make like, you know, 47 48 somewhere in there. So. Which you're happy to see considering, you know, he... Obviously, he believes in it enough to put his money up, which I'd always heard that was the rule in Hollywood. Do never, never put your own money up for projects, yeah. <laughs> which is like a, kind of a, like I understand, I guess, you know, I guess I think it's also it, just a vanity thing. Yeah, I guess um, it's like, hey, you know, there's always somebody there. Not always, but I don't know. He reinvested in himself and it has paid off. Yeah. Um, whether or not you like glass or not, uh, he has, you know, he was kind of to some people a joke you know after a certain point you know like even when uh the trailer for devil came out yeah or, people or, were yeah, reacting to his name laughing being at his it. name like oh yeah like i'm I think not gonna he, see that movie people have come to expect everything he makes to have a big twist so um, like i said so without getting any spoilers really for the movie just discussing glass in general so you got bruce willis you got sam jackson you got james mcavoy um anya taylor joy the newcomer is sarah paulson and um then you have the returning actor, I'm forgetting off the head, that played um, David Dunn's son. 
I was like, oh, it's like one of those cases where the actor actually gets to portray the same role as an adult. Which I love because this is so tightly woven to, you know, to that first film. And it's, I mean, and, and to Split as well. And it's always sad when they recast because there's been some, um, what was it Independence Day? They recast the president's daughter because um, I believe the actress that originally played her was Mae Whitman, who was on Arrested Development as Anne and a bunch of other stuff. And it's like she's a working actress, but they recast her with hey, uh, what's uh, what's his name from? Uh, oh my God! Now, now I feel bad from uh, Phantasm too. Uh, oh, uh, a Michael Baldwin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, slap in the face. Um, let's see. So his son was portrayed by Spencer Treat Clark. Was Joseph Dunn? Um, and then Glass's mother. Yes, um, was. Charlene Woodard. So ironically enough, the actress that played Mr. Glass's mom is actually younger than Sam Jackson, but I guess they play with makeup her age way up, play his down, and it's nothing that drew too much, you know, strain credibility too much during watching the movie, but easier to age up. I think that when you watch this movie, the main thing that you kind of got to be aware of going into it is that, you know, even though it's kind of billed as like a superhero movie grounded in the quote-unquote real world, the budget was $20 million. So you will not see buildings toppling and giant creatures. And honestly, we've seen enough of that. We see that four to five times a year. You know, between the three... uh, Between Marvel, DC, and... And then sometimes you have X-Men. You know, you have the Sony making Marvel films and then Fox making Marvel films as well. Like, you get that at least... Three times a year for Marvel, let alone, you know, yeah. by themselves. We get um, the big event films from all yeah. the major studios. Even the non-superhero movies a lot of times will have big spectacle effects. Yeah. So this one was kind of promising to be a little bit more of a grounded movie. Um, and if you haven't seen the trailers, you know, I won't spoil it. But, like, the movie starts off um, pretty exciting. Uh, the movie kicks off. And I was actually sitting there, I was like, oh, man. And I was really excited for it. So the first act really gets your anticipation up and then the set, like then they kind of dial back into what the movie's actually going to be and you're like, "Oh, okay, this is this is going to be this for the next I'm assuming 45 minutes or an hour." Mm-hmm. And it is. Mm-hmm. Um and there's some elements that it kind of feels like it was purposefully cutting budget maybe or or scripting it to be um achievable on a lower budget. You know what? Maybe, but maybe not. Here, here's my only argument against that. Um, so I overall, you know, Rotten Tomato score, which I know some people hate that. They don't want to, you know, they they value individual reviews. Yeah. But it is much lower than the previous two films, he had, previous three films he's done, or at least somewhat. I think it was like a 37% or something. Yeah, because right um, now, so the Metacritic is 42, which is, so the, the Rotten yeah. Tomato score is like in the 30s. Um, not that that, like you said, cause the main thing with Rotten Tomatoes is it's not saying, so let's just say it has a 34% cause I think that's what it was at some point. If it has a 34% out of a hundred percent, that doesn't mean that the aggregate average review of everything that was reviewed was a 34%. That means 34% of reviews have been more negative than positive. You mean more, more positive than negative. 34% or, or I'm is sorry, how many yes. positive. Yeah. Yes. Because yeah. on the Rotten Tomatoes meter, if 100% of reviews are more positive than negative, it's 100%. But that's even if it is everything is, you know, two and a half or like th- three Seven out of five. Out of ten or something, yeah. So there's movies where you can have everybody gives it a three out of five because they're like, yeah, this is perfectly fine. And it's got 100%. But then there's other movies that are a little bit more polarizing. They get much better reviews when they yeah. do get them positive. So like I that. saw this today on a Monday, uh, fairly fresh, which my opinions may change over time as, as they do. And sometimes with... Um, films that maybe are don't take a traditional route, you know. Yeah. Sometimes those change wildly over time. Sometimes people will uh, get colder on them. Sometimes they get hotter on them. For me, my expectations were tempered because I had, you know, Heard I had it had been a whole weekend of social media and I had seen a, f- a few defenders of it, and so I was like, okay, well, this gives me hope, but uh, but you know, I'm not I'm not expecting anything that is going to be a home run for sure. Uh, overall, I I really liked it. But, you know, going into what you were talking about, the second act kind of um, slows down. Uh, I for me, I even though I enjoyed elements of kind of the middle part, um, which I thought was. I don't want to say the weakest because it does definitely has some important elements like, you know, that's a it's it's the meat of the film, really. Um, I I do think that is it is 
really uneven and not well paced. I think that's the issue with it for me. I'm fine if it's just people talking, but it doesn't feel feel well paced. And it's, you know, it is a lot of character building for for character payoff and stuff. But, you know, I was thinking too, when when I left the theater, I'm like, that movie was two hours and six minutes. If they would have shaved off some of that second act, it would have maybe have been, uh, you know, a faster pace, a little bit more exciting for certain people. But... I can't say if that's a better experience because I didn't see a cut of this film that was 90 minutes. It could have been very, it could have felt very empty otherwise. Well, and, and to like um, something I would equate this to, because after watching it, so what this movie kind of reminded me of is the TV show like Heroes, the show that was on NBC in the late 2000s, mid to late 2000s, um, where it was like the quote unquote like real world with people that had superhero abilities and such, like save the cheerleaders, save the world, all that stuff. And then that season, a lot of times on those types of shows, after you've seen a power or a character be powered up and actually be able to do things, they then have to find some way to bring them back down for the next season of the show. And it's often like an amnesia story or stuff like that. So that this, this movie felt like it was an entire, like multiple seasons of a show like that, where the first act is like, you know, getting into what you want. And then the second act is bringing it back down and taking out the yeah. ability for everyone to use power. So, you know, Unbreakable does have a lot of, not a lot, but it does have action moments throughout. You know, yeah. we, we get, it's peppered throughout. Obviously, it's not a traditional superhero film. And at the time, there really was no mold for traditional superhero well, and film. Too, and that movie was, the, the opinions on that seem to trend a lot more positively now than they did at the time it came yeah. out. Like, it was kind of a mixed yeah. bag. It still made money, but... So, you know, the first act of this, which I, I also loved, it reminded me that also that's, you know the reason I like Unbreakable is not because of the action stuff. It is because of the character, because even though, you know, if you know that character, if you've seen that film, yeah, the first act of this is exciting, but also too, it could be pretty empty. If you, if you view it as its own thing, like I I real watching that, I realized actually the action is not what I care about in these films. You know, um, it is, it's, you know, this isn't, it doesn't need to rely on that. Um, this isn't like a Marvel film, which those have many other elements. I'm not disparaging them. You know, there's yeah. a lot of entertainment comedy, you know, great characters in, in many of those films. Um, but watching the action as much as I did love it. And I, I like, love that unbreakable character. And you get to see this kind of showdown, yeah. um, that was set up basically, or, uh, hinted on at, at the end of split. Um, and which was a great, you know, it, it, it's, you get to see some combat in the first act. Um, and then, like you said, it brings it back down, even though that combat is there and it's good. Um, it almost felt rushed, but you needed something in that beginning part because of the way the rest of the film unfolds. But at the same time, I was like, yeah, I like this, but, um, that's made me realize that's not why I love Unbreakable. I think just that film just builds the lore so well. And, you know, it's that, that movie does such a good job of doling out information at such a good pace. And it just keeps drawing you in more and more. And it's not about, I mean, yeah, there, there's a, I guess, a twist in that film and, and more revelations, you know, more yeah. of a revelation of a, of a typical superhero film or something like that. And that's kind of how this film is, too. Um, it's not a thing that flips the whole thing on your plan. It's more of like, oh, you know, um, I'm learning information for the first time, as is some of these characters. Um, it's it's not anything that's going to um, change the way you look at the film and watch it a second time. Like, and some people are disappointed when they see a Shyamalan film that doesn't have that. Like, well, I think at this point, like his name has almost become a verb. Yeah. Um, and t- you know, just saying when people go into his movies, they anticipate some big third act plot twist that just turns everything on its head. And something I'll say between like this movie and something like The Sixth Sense is in The Sixth Sense, when you know what the twist is and you rewatch it, you're like, oh, there actually are clues and a little bit of yeah, foreshadowing yeah. And stuff here to lead you to, to think about this. In Glass, what the third act reveals are like one of them that's a, like supposed like a big reveal. If you took that out of the movie, the movie doesn't operate any differently, really. Yeah. Um, it just adds a little bit more world building. But the other like the main reveal of things that aren't apparent at first, when you rewatch like I only saw it the one time, but if I think if you were to rewatch the movie, there's nothing that hints of that or yeah, foreshadows it, it. It does feel more just like a traditional superhero film, you know, where, oh, this is, you know, this is maybe something that we're all getting at the same time or something. And and sometimes they are foreshadowed in those films. A lot of times they're not, though. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I've heard some people say, hey, you know, the, the revelation of this film or the end of the film is, is kind of unexciting. Um, for me, I, you know... 
I, I enjoyed it overall. Like I, uh, I was kind of messaging you and Derek after I saw the film, I feel like the highs in this for me were high, higher than the high moments of split. And it is that culmination of those two films. Uh, but also it has a lot to do with, uh, yo, I like seeing Bruce Willis a lot on screen, you know, Bruce Willis, James McAvoy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I would say this Sam movie, Jackson. The movie is really the showcase for James McAvoy. Yeah. Because um, Bruce Willis doesn't get a ton to do. Um, and Sam Jackson, when he actually, you know, is in full on glass mode, he's very entertaining. Um, but the movie, like, it almost seems like they're side characters to a movie. Uh-huh. Like, because it, it seems like the main the main story really is more of Sarah Paulson's character and, and you know, Kevin Crumb and the James McAvoy character. It seems like they're, like, more of the focus. Yeah. And, and Split was more of, like, a thriller movie yes. that had these different elements sprinkled in. So I think what a lot of people were kind of expecting going into Glass was more of a pulpy thriller movie that had the villain of Split against the hero of Unbreakable in a more grounded type movie like that where it's kind of a cat and mouse with a big showdown. And the way this movie is structured is to subvert those expectations. And I'm fine with that. Uh-huh. You can subvert the expectations and make it a contemplation about superheroes and comics and all that stuff. Like, the one thing I'll say is that the world that I'm, like, you know, you mentioned Unbreakable when it came out, there weren't as many superhero films. It came out in a world where comic book and superhero culture was a lot different than it is today. Because back then, that was, like, I think the same year the X-Men film came out. It was the year, same year within a year. And um, the same Raimi Spider-Man movies hadn't come out yet. There hadn't been, you know, it was year, it was eight years before Iron Man kicked off the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So, you know, even it was years ahead of um, Batman Begins was 2005. So it was ahead of all these kind of resurgence of all these comic book movies. So it was a much different atmosphere then than now. And I don't know that there's really any huge commentary he's made about the superhero comic book culture. Yeah, and, um, I, and I don't think that was the goal. I mean, I mean, I, I've heard some people say, oh, he's behind the curve now because, you know, we have all these movies now. And really, you know, uh, kind of some of the the themes of, or at least the the world building on Unbreakable hasn't really changed drastically. It's not like they flip that on the head. Yeah. You know, they more just dig in deeper. And I don't think that's any less valid though, because it very much is about these old heroes and, and all that stuff can still be said. It's just, we have new stories with those heroes, you know? And, and I think if there's more commentary on it, then, then that kind of becomes about um, a specific maybe movie business or the way culture is right now, because, you know, it was never really about a certain culture at the time too much. It was more just about um, the myths and heroes and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think like, the main thing, and, I, and it doesn't date it. I think. I think if yeah. if they would have leaned into right now what cultures, well, then in twenty years this would have seemed more like a dated movie. I think that's why Unbreakable still holds up. Yeah, because they weren't commenting on uh, uh, the Tim Burton Batman films and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Well, it I mean, didn't feel like it was his own thing. They did name check some stuff, yeah. but more classical yes. things, not anything from the past fifteen years. Um, like so, they, I th- this film. This series beats its own drum for sure. Because I think so. I think the main thing that can drive people to really dislike this movie from right off the bat is you're going to get a, a big section of the movie where it's you know character building or world building, and you're not getting action throughout. You're not getting a lot of the superhero movies. You know, you'll have like the big first act thing that sets the character on a path. The second act is getting back up to snuff and up to power, and then the third act is the showdown. And this movie subverts a lot of that stuff and doesn't deliver the same structure or format you want from a superhero film. And it really doesn't deliver deliver the visceral thrills you would want from kind of like a sequel to Split in terms of like what that it, movie was. It, yeah, it is not a thriller in that, you know, uh, you've seen from the trailer, these characters are locked up. And, and you know, there's really not a lot of danger. You're wondering when or, or how are they going to get out? You yeah. know, that's what you're wondering, but you aren't seeing any sort of danger or threat throughout. So you, you're not on the edge of your seat. Your guard is down. And I think maybe that allows you to pay attention to, you know, some of the character and world building. Now, it is all of that, will all of that hold up to the test of time? On the first viewing, maybe I was waiting for things to fast forward a little bit. Yeah. So I was, again, like I said, I did not feel, feel that second act was well-paced. When in and two, something that's just a technical thing that may other people may have noticed. Like, it seemed there was a ton of like single character close up shots, like very, very close up shots 
on characters just, you know, single shots. I'm wondering if that was to get around the availability of people's time on set and to have to have the main cast together as few days as possible on scheduling. Yeah, I, I, it didn't really stand out to me. I know you'd, you'd mentioned that the night before. Well, it, was just, it was kind of like and a I kind of noticed a couple of tight shots, but I, none of it felt... Um, None of it drew attention to itself to me personally. It was just it just felt like slightly like a departure from what they had done before yeah. and the other ones, which is you know, it's just fine. It's just I think that the big thing that drives a lot of the think the negativity towards this movie in the review community is what, you know, unbreakable setup and split setup, this movie then kind of st- it's kind of like a video game structure. You start off with like the conflict and then you get brought back down um with, you know, not being able to take advantage of all the powers and all that stuff. So I think that the movie's kind of a, a slog in the middle. Uh-huh. Uh, if people are wanting it to be a quicker paced movie and they want, like I said, not even people wanting it to be people flying in space yeah. and fighting, just wanting there to be more of a thriller element to it. Um, so people going into it, wanting it to be more of an extension of a good guy versus a bad guy. And they want that to be the structure. That's the culmination of the movie. And with Mr. Glass somehow fitting in, if that's the key thing that you want out of it, then yeah, you'd probably be disappointed because the structure of it doesn't really lend it, itself to that. For me, this is very much, you know, unbreakable. You can almost look at an unbreakable as Batman Begins. And, you know, this is more, I mean, not exactly, but let's just not at all. But I'm saying the Dark Knight was about Joker mainly. You know, Batman had his story told. Yeah. Bruce Willis has had his story told. You know, he had kind, yeah. of, he had, kind of had his character arc um, in that first film. Uh he doesn't really have, you know, he doesn't really have one in here in this film. He, yeah. he, uh, you know, he goes through some ups and downs a little bit, uh, as far as, uh, where his, I guess, mind is in the world. Um, but it's not, no, no huge swing. So it really is, you know, you really are kind of thinking, okay, who, who's going through this major, um, character arc that is kind of earned or whatever, because, you know, Really, it's hard to say who the main character is in this film. It's called Glass. It's about all three. James McAvoy probably has the most screen time. Um, but again, Sarah Paulson's character is important. But it is very, like you said, untraditionally structured, I think. And, and the focus is not... Um, having just seen it today, I haven't really thought about the breakdown. But uh, but it's hard to see who the main character is, where the where the high stakes are at through a lot of this. So I think that's why it's it's maybe less engaging than you would expect when, from from maybe those two films because those were so singularly focused. You know, those two, are so well focused on the those other, characters. The other thing is, having seen the prior two films, you know what the characters are capable of, and then having a part of the movie call that into question to a lot of people is very frustrating. That's where I mentioned stuff like the show Heroes or whatever. Yeah, I haven't seen that. Well, um, but just like stuff where. You know, like video games, you start out the game with all your powers yeah. and you lose them. So this one is kind of like you've seen all the stuff that's happened in the prior film. So you know what yeah. is real and what is not. And calling all that into question, um, you know, like like Ash vs. Evil Dad had a part where they're all in a mental institution. It's like, is this real or not? And yeah. there's a, like all kinds of TV shows use that trope and movies and sequels and stuff. Um, so I think that part could be tiring to people. But the thing is, like, ultimately... For me, the movie, I was along for the ride and I was, you know, open to what it was doing. And then when you got to the third act and you had the reveals of what everybody's actual intent was and what was really going on, as it unfolded, I'm like, okay, that, you know, this is, this is interesting. I'm digging this. But then the way it concluded and ended things and the way that the character arcs wrapped up to me was very unsatisfying. And then the payoff of what, everything culminated in it felt kind of like you got an ending and you're like oh that was the ending and then you get another ending it's like Oop, that ending's invalid here's the ending and i feel like sometimes there's a little bit of whiplash and it makes things feel like there's less weight to them when you kind of pull the rug out a couple times in a row um and just like i said like i have to wait for spoilers to get more into the specifics there's like a couple of things where it's just like this didn't need to go this way yeah, for this ending I, I was happy with the ending um I've seen some criti- criticisms of it, but I was happy with the ending uh, overall. Um, well, it was also um, a slight misread of how that same specific, like it's a slight misread of how society and technology and things work today in the real world. Um, 
like maybe because M. Night Shyamalan had said that he had come up with this ending or this general concept for the ending back in 2000. Uh It's like, I could see that because that works a lot better in like 2000 to 2006 than it does now. Yeah. But anyway, I, yeah, I, I like where this film ends up. Um, and I think it's like a great conclusion to it that, that I'm satisfied, you know, if nothing ever comes of, of this series again, but I, mean, I think um, it would be the end of it. Yeah, just I do I too. See... I do too. Ba- based on how it ends, um, I'm, well, you... I'm happy with it. And, and I don't feel like, oh man, they totally missed the landing. You know what I mean? Like for me, um, again, this has some really high highs, I think, uh, a bit uneven at parts. But honestly, the uneven parts for me, maybe I'll appreciate those more on our rewatches now that I kind of know the path that this this film takes and knows what this and i know what this film is i, mean, I think it will age better over time um because i think just if the immediate anticipation was this big showy um setup yeah and you know you know is like a showdown and then it kind of subverts expectations and yeah. goes directions you might not expect that's the type of thing where it does take a little bit of while, a little bit of time for people to kind of cool off and either yeah. kind of come to terms with it or just dislike it but but again, for me, even the first act, when you see, you know, a little bit of a showdown, I was like, yeah, I'm enjoying this, but there's not really much weight behind it. I need, you know, I need a lot of character stuff now. You know, I was ready for it to kind of, I'm not saying ready for that to get over with as it was happening because I was appreciating it, but I was like, man, this is not, I'm not into this as much as I thought I was going to. Maybe I should have watched Unbreakable and Split, you know what I mean? Like back to back right before I went to see it because it yeah. has been a while, um, but I'm familiar enough and watched I mean, I think I probably only watched Split once, but Unbreakable I've seen several times. I mean, I, um, and, and too, like, I don't think that, because um, like I think I said, coming from what, because Unbreakable and Split were two completely different types of films. Yeah. Um, so it, it feels like they kind of just add, they tacked on the, because I know that um, the the discussion was that Ke- um, Kevin Wendell Crumb or, you know, the Horde was actually characters initially in Unbreakable. They got pulled out because there was too much going on for that to fit in there, too. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I believe that. But then just like I don't know that the entire thing was structured out the way that this all is. I don't know if it was either, but I think, uh, you know, I think the way they tied together, I think, has done really well. And it for me, it doesn't feel forced. Uh, so I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm just really happy, especially with a series that, you know, it's got three films in it, and the, the last two came in the past two years, over eighteen year period, or whatever. Yeah, you know, so I, a, I think for me that's that's a pretty big success, so especially coming off of where his career was at um, right before. It's a really strange structure for that to have yes. one film and then a movie um, seventeen years later that's kind of a backdoor sequel, just by essentially a post credit scene that then ties them together. And then that launches into a third movie that brings it all back together. But yeah. like, I, and I think too, so like the reviews are saying like some of the Rotten Tomatoes, like a 34% in Metacritic. Like, I think it's way better than those scores. I think it's not a three or four out of 10. I think it's better than that. I think just that to me, if a couple of things have played out in a way that were more satisfying to me on the end, then it's getting up into that territory of like, you know, eight, nine, whatever. Yeah. Um, but as it is to me, it's, you know, like six, yeah. somewhere in that range. Like I enjoyed it enough. Like I didn't hate it. Um, I think it's just, you give the disclaimer, it's not going to give you exactly what you want based off, um, you know, just that the concept of a good guy fighting a bad guy. Like it's not, it's not just another superhero film or even like the kind of postmodern superhero films like kick ass or whatever, where they themselves devolve in like when kick ass is satirizing comic books by the end, it plays out like a comic book. Yeah. Um, and that's what most of those types of movies typically fall into. This doesn't really do that. Um, it goes in a more, in a different direction. But I also don't feel like it gave me blue balls, you know, and knowing the successes of unbreakable and why that film holds up, you know, good films hold up because of good characters. Uh, sometimes because of excellent action, yeah. but you know, you think about many superhero films a lot of superhero films you can basically throw out the way that throw away the action you know you enjoy yeah. it while you're watching it but that isn't a lot of times why you're coming back to watch those films over and over again yeah it's not because oh man there's just so much like normally superhero films the action in them are they're pretty you know they're pretty standard fair and and it's normally the drama and the characters that keep you coming back and, and unbreakable was definitely that so uh, I was I was ready for that. You know, I wasn't like expecting a big action spectacle because uh, 
I have not seen the Shyamalan films like Airbender and After Earth or whatever, which I assume are more action oriented. Like yeah. I haven't really seen an action film from him, even though Unbreakable, maybe you could call it an action film. Um, you know, at least action elements. But uh, but so I give it about an eight out of ten. Um, I really liked it. Uh, I probably gave uh, Split an eight out of ten as well. I don't remember yeah. what I gave it, but even though it's in that ballpark. Uh, I would rather probably watch this one again only because again, I like all those actors, you know, uh, the yeah. thriller element of split is so focused and well-crafted. And I think that's a, I think it's a great film. Um, and it's, it, it kind of nails the execution and there's, it doesn't go wrong really. Oh, Th- this film does go wrong a little bit at times. Um, cause the one thing I forgot to mention with that, like the specifics, like, so the character of Casey, Anya Taylor joy, who uh-huh. is also in split, I know a lot of people took issue with the way that character arc played out just based on the fact that I think theoretically Glass is set like three weeks after the ending of Split. Yeah. Like sometime pretty close to it. And it's like, I don't know this tracks with the ending of the prior movie. Um, And just like the way that they kind of set things up, like I'm not sure that I really buy this. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we can get into that in the spoiler. So just, I'm just saying a lot of people said that gave short shrift to that character and didn't really. <laughs> yeah. And, and again, like I said, sense. I think that's the pacing and, and the character, you know, they have so many characters in this film that are have been built up over previous films, and it's it's hard to gauge. You know, I don't know. I can't say. I can think like, oh, they should have done this, and that's you know never good to say because you never know what you know what yeah. their intentions are. Maybe they didn't want to do that, but I feel like they tried to give enough time to all the characters, and not all of that um, is a uh, flawless execution. You know, a yeah. lot of it does feel kind of missteps, shorthands, and stuff like that. But I will I will say that. Um, when they were bringing back, you know, his his son and and her and everything through part of the film, I felt like, man, I feel like I, I hope he's just not shoehorning these people in, you know, just to kind of build this world. But I mean, there was but, ultimate purpose to it. Yes, there was. So I, I was satisfied with why they were in the film. I did not feel that they were in there uh, but then, just, just for fan service. But or then whatever. the question becomes, how well does all of it actually yes. come together for you? So a- absolutely. So we keep dancing. So I think we can move in now discussing spoilers. So hang on, you... sorry, hang on one second. I have one other thing to say about, it and I can't. <laughs> oh, it was right on the tip of my tongue uh, before we jumped over to that. Um, all right, we we can go into spoilers. All right, so we'll discuss spoilers. So if you haven't seen the movie, we're going to discuss major plot points from it. So. Uh, you probably don't want to listen to this if you haven't seen the movie, so you've been warned. And go watch Unbreakable and Split if you haven't seen the film either. I, yeah. I think those are those are must views because I think uh, you know honestly, if you haven't seen those films, I could see the Rotten Tomato score. You know, I could see a oh, yeah. lot more negative reviews if you have not been invested in those because this film would feel much more like a botched execution, I believe. Well, if you don't have any of the background on Unbreakable or Split, then these movies aren't going to add it, up to a lot. Yeah, and, and may, maybe maybe every critic that reviewed it has seen both those well, films, I think, but it will be interesting to kind of pick that out and I say... Because I think that like Split, you didn't really need to see Unbreakable, but like at the end of it, yeah. you're just like, oh, it's his character yeah, it notes operates. from that. Then you can go back and watch it, and you're fine. But I think that at this point, you need to have seen both movies for this movie. To and really and I don't really all. condone that traditionally. I think you know every film should operate well on its own. And this film, I don't think really uh, succeeds at that. You know, I don't think I think the impact is definitely uh, higher valued if you've then, seen those. At the same time, the fact that it makes you kind of try to doubt what's going on works better if you haven't had prior movies confirming things yes. to be true. Yeah, so. yeah. I think I think he tried to walk a line as far as the audience on this. Yeah. Um, and oh, other thing I was gonna say, I love the way this film was directed. You know, I, I love his, you know, he does feel much more like uh, this feels like if a Spielberg, you know, I, I don't want to say, I don't know, this feels like a, uh, a limited budget Spielberg direction. You know, he's well, everything is seems very deliberate. Um, I love, you know, I don't know. I just love his his camera choices. Um, it feels more classically directed it, it actually felt like a film out of the 90 late 90s at times with okay. the music and not in a bad way in a just kind of like stylistically this has its own feel um that kind of takes you back a little bit for me personally the split felt more contemporary yeah. and a little bit different and had more like handheld and like practical outdoor streets uh set scenes and and things that just kind of shook it up a little bit and glass feels more like you know shot reverse like more kind of standard filmmaking it feels um, yeah if it, it but i mean there's nothing wrong with that I mean, stylistically it, it seems more like it, unbreakable it but feels more classical i guess you would say yeah. 
Um, and like, there's not any crazy cinematography of, you know, cameras going through stuff and around no. stuff. And it's just, you know, more classically. Well, I, I love the way the fight scenes are, um, are shot a lot of times cause they're so, they give such a different flavor. You know, they don't always show you everything. And obviously, yeah, you can, you can say, Oh, that's a, you know, that's, that's a budget thing. Well, it doesn't really matter because at the same time it's dual purpose because it gives a different flavor. We've seen, you know, you know, you see John Wick where, they do these long takes, you know, these amazing action. You know, you see the superhero films that has CGI action all over the place. You get to see everything. That's not what this film is. And and because of the budget constraints, possibly. But, you know, just the way they, they construct so many of the action scenes, I love. Sometimes you're in the, you're you know, maybe you're inside of a room or, or just inside of something. And you see the punches come through the wall. Or you see somebody just get... Um, thrown against the wall where you don't actually see the combat like yeah it just has such a different flavor and that was actually way more exciting to me than seeing a traditionally staged fight scene on a lot of this and there's some traditionally staged fight scenes for sure but it just it, it felt so much uh fresher and just i don't know just more exciting um uh obviously yes it, it helped with the budget as far as shooting some stuff differently but it didn't feel like oh they were constrained so this looks like crap it just felt like a really strong stylistic choice and uh yeah, I just I, I love the direction of this film too, and that's another reason why I want to rewatch it because um, I like the way this film was directed. You know, more than more than split even, and um, yeah, I just I, I love the way it looks stylistically. Yeah, so I'm so, good for spoilers now. That was so, the only thing I was going to say. The direction of it, I love. So spoiler time. Like I said, if you haven't seen the movie, we're going to discuss the big plot points. So to me, like I said, so you have the movie start out with the horde and. I guess um, the overseer is what they call David Dunn's character, like tippy the, toes or something. He doesn't yeah, want to be the called tiptoe man or something. <laughs> so they had the kind of fun moments where you know you had David Dunn, his son Joseph, and his son was literally like the guy in the earpiece at the computer. So that's like a trope that's yeah. been satirized. So he's literally I mean, it was so great that it was his son. Too, yeah, you know, and it like, made so much sense, yeah. and it was a follow through from Unbreakable, and they use like old footage from Unbreakable. So you know. Not to get off on a tangent, but when when uh, he walked in, Bruce was it Dunn, his last name? Yeah. When he when he walked into his uh, security office, and you didn't know, you saw his son sitting there, and I didn't even know it was his son at first. Yeah. I didn't know he was in this film. Um, you hear, you see him walk through. Well, Bruce Willis is not in focus. His son is, and he says something. And this isn't. It doesn't. Sh I mean, it shows him go into his security office before this, but for some reason, uh, I thought that was uh, John H. Benjamin. <laughs> I thought it sounded Ray like his Sean voice Benjamin. and it kind of, you know, his outline can look like him as far as, and I thought, is John H. Benjamin in this movie? I was like, oh my God, this movie's just already jumped up two points for me. Yeah, uh, but I don't well, know why he sounded like him. And of course he kind of looks like him if you got the camera out of focus. Well, but like, uh, like to me, so you have like this kind of setup of, you know, like him, like, you know, David Dunn and his son being, you know, the superhero and the guy on the computer on the headset. Um, and you have him going after the big villain, the whore, and you have a big fight scene between them and then it, ends up with the paramilitary police force led by Sarah Paulson's character stopping them. And then that's where the movie kind of shift gears, shifts gears from what you expected and puts them in an institution. And she says she has three days to convince them that they're not actually superheroes or villains. They don't have powers, which is where it's a frustrating part because you know, they do you've seen the prior movies. Um, so you're like, is this really just going to be them trying to convince them? They don't have the things that we know that they have. Um, and then like but, things but drag. you also wonder you know what's the revelation to me because normally in films when that happens the person you know discovers it's true and then they're like oh my god i was wrong the whole time yeah. like you know i think that was and maybe where you were supposed to be led down that path so and then, maybe they were going to save her you know yeah and, and then you she had, was going to be a believer you had uh glasses in the same um institution he was kind of in a catatonic state with his medication and then when you know he sees david dunn that kind of brings the glitter back to him um and all that kind of kicks off. And you have, like I said, you have the stuff where um, the character of Casey is very sympathetic to the Horde and the Beast and all Casey that stuff. Casey is Anya. Casey. Yeah, Anya Taylor Joy. From uh, Split. From F Split. So her character is sympathetic to, you know, like Kevin, I guess. Because I guess, like, the, the, the way that it all tracks is at the end of Split, she had been given the confidence or whatever to then take action to get out of the home with her abusive uncle. So I guess she kind of attributes the positive aspects of that to Kevin, the, the you know, I guess the 
prime personality of Kevin Wendell Crumb, like the actual personality of him that's being protected by all of his alternate personalities. So I guess she connected with like the base personality of who he is without the alternate personalities. Because he was also abused. Because he was abused. And then she saw through like the beast and the creature, whatever, like the strength to then stand up for herself. But like, I still don't know that she is really like the emotional core for him because like, regardless of what, you know, she got yeah. out of that, he still killed the other two girls. And yeah, it killed I mean, others I, I, you know, I see it from I, the other, movie. I saw it as, um, she was looking past that and, you know, that, that he was a kin or a similar soul. That she was abused. looking at Kevin, not, you know, uh, the evils that were born out of the abuses he had had, you yeah. know? And, and I think that is at least a better message um, I'm not saying tracking with anything with her, her story, but I'm saying at least, um, this film, even with the way it resolves on, on some level, I don't want to skip all the way to the end, but as, as far as the way he was calmed down and, and essentially stopped was her actually giving him affection and, and, yeah. and, you know, uh, love. And yeah. sometimes in these films, uh, whenever there is a character who, um, is dealing with some sort of horror films, especially with some sort of. Uh, mental problem it is the solution is to shoot and kill them you yeah. know what i mean and that's often a criticism at least this film goes that far and you know not to say oh at least give them a pass but i'm saying i at least appreciate at that point where it's like yeah. okay the message here isn't like uh you know spoiler lights out where we've got to shoot the person has to commit suicide you know yeah, what I mean? to stop so, the evils yeah and it's not saying that mental illness is bad it's saying this guy happened to have a mental condition yeah. And also happen to have power. Yes. Uh, so it's not that, you know, you have a mental condition or bad. It's just somebody that happened to have that as a defense mechanism for the upbringing they had also happened to have other powers. And having somebody that truly cared about him, whether or not her her art tracks or not is irrelevant. But at least yeah. from his perspective, somebody that actually cares about him is at least a way to healing like that's not and, totally uh, tone deaf. And I would, you know. I would say for the most part, David Dunn essentially has no arc in this movie because yeah, he comes in with, you know, just being operating at the sun as like a team, which is really awesome to see. Like that in of itself can make its own movie. Um, but again, but, what is the movie there? Because then I think it falls into traditional uh, genre elements. Yeah. Which Unbreakable was not. That. You know, it ruminated on a but lot I of. I think the thing like part of it is like through Unbreakable, he came to realize, oh, I do actually have powers. Yes. So in this movie, to walk that back and have him doubt it for part of the movie, it just it's like I mean you're just spinning tires here. Um, yeah, but honestly, he you know he 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 tips his toe in the doubt for a second. I think I don't think it's any big thing. I mean, it's really but like he, but, but Glass has to get or you know when he's over the speaker, yeah. Glass has to reinvigorate him with the same type of motivational thing he got. And unbreakable. Yeah, he just wants to, you know, I think it's, that was a small bit. And honestly, it was probably something to give his character to do. And I'm not saying that's but too, the, like, it was the right thing. For me watching it, it was slightly frustrating. It's like, well, he is not a killer. He is not responsible for the deaths of in innocent people. I mean, he has done vigilante justice. But why is there more of a conversation between him and like Sarah Paulson's character? Like he didn't speak many words at all. Yeah. Uh, so it was just kind of frustrating. It's like if he just talked things out more. So I think part of my frustration comes from that side. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, so in this movie, seeing like Elijah Glass, he does, you know, spoiler alert, he does come back from being in a catatonic state or else there's no movie. Yeah. And, you know, he's hatching his own plan and has his own machinations. And there's like the classic, he's teaming up with the horde. So the villains team up against the good guy, but he doesn't like, which he is even, what the trailers were selling. Was selling, but then the thing is, though, he even kind of says that he views Dunn as kind of a friend or yeah. the other side of him. I, I've I viewed him, you know, towards the end of this film, I thought, oh, Glass is essentially Magneto. You know, yeah. after the re re resolution of this film, you know, he may be evil, but at the same time, he's the one. Some that of his motivations role. are, you know, understandable at least, as far as, uh, you know, maybe some of his, maybe the end goal is going to have good things and positive things come out of it, you know? Well, I mean, I think, too, though, the... So, like I said, so you you have that where he actually comes out of his stupor and he's actually able to avoid getting, essentially, a lobotomy through a surgery with, like, a laser Did he put stuff. a thing in there to block it? What? Or he changed it out. Okay, that's what I thought. That's what I thought, and I so was they like... So they're going to give him a surgery if he doesn't respond properly or, or they see him outside of his room. Um, so he has rigged up the machine that they'll use for the surgery on him. And he got out of his room and talked to Kevin or one of the personalities like Patricia or whoever. I'm forgetting which ones he talked to and set up that he was going to work with them and get them out. 
And he said, we're all getting out. So it implied they're also getting yeah. David Dunn out. So, you know, he's saying that they're going to go and destroy some building in front of everybody and prove to the world that they exist. And all this stuff's going on. And then you find out ultimately what's going on was his plan was for the Horde and David Dunn to have a fight and use their powers on screen, knowing that the institution has a ton of security cameras and he had hacked into the machine, was sending all the footage off um, to a separate server. So that Which we that saw him then, doing something with a computer. Yeah, so you, you know, saw a little bit of that. And to, you know, I know you said he felt like the rug, I feel like the rug didn't get pulled out again for me because I feel like it was foreshadowed because he says during kind of the, the final showdown, he's like, this isn't a uh, special edition issue. He said, this is an origin story. So I think for me, that was enough for me to not feel like it was a cheap turn or anything. I think that, I mean, I don't think it was necessarily cheap. It's just you have all this um, going on where there's, the fighting between the Horde and David Dunn, and then you find out that actually Sarah Paulson's character works for an organization that wants to stop people that have superpowers. She, they see the heroes and villains as the same, and they don't want people to have godlike powers amongst the average person. Well, well also, too, not even just the same. They think that, uh, which is which was Glass's um, philosophy in the film, that if you have a positive force, there will be a negative force. And just like yeah. the Dark Knight, there's the Joker, there's the Batman. Because well, she even says at some point, she's like, if it was just you, we would have left it alone. Yeah. But then when the Horde showed up, we had to get involved. Yeah, and she knows that, you know, in traditional superhero characters, there's not a hero without a villain. And normally if there's, a, you know what I mean? So she thinks that if um, more people are inspired to be heroes, that is just going to create more villains in the there's world. There's more people that it's unfair they have powers. And that's yeah. also like, is that commentary on... <laughs> The quote unquote powerful people don't want those that are beneath their station in life to have power. They don't. Yeah. Is it a jealousy thing? But so then you find out that their entire plan was that she had three days to convince them, um, Glass, the Horde, and David Dunn, that they actually don't have the abilities or any of the things that they think. And it can all be attributed to normal science, and there's nothing going on that's out of the normal. And if she could convince them of that, then they would not kill them and let them go. Um, but if she couldn't convince them of that, then they have to kill them. So during that fight, um, like we said, you know, David Dunn and the Horde are fighting and they get thrown in the water thing, a big water tank. Um, and then David Dunn's able to hit it and like it breaks and they get out. And then when the Horde is trying to leave, then, um, Casey like, you know, hugs him and calms him down and then he's back to Kevin, and then one of like their snipers shoots well, no, and kills him. Before that, he's on the van about to. Uh, oh go yeah, after he finds out that Dunn. um yes. he finds out that his dad was actually on the train that David Dunn was on that was sabotaged by Gl Mr. Glass, which seems like if it's an easily Google, if you can just find the information via Google, it doesn't make a ton of sense that you know the personalities of Kevin Crumb wouldn't know that. Well, he lived in a cave under the zoo. You know but what like I mean? his like, dad, he would have known that his dad died on that yeah. train, and like I assume that he could. Yeah, I yeah, I guess so. Maybe. Um, yeah, that's a valid point. But they they also kind of uh, allude to that a little bit. Like you see some revelations, and honestly, I'd forgotten the names and everything. And I'm like, yeah. okay, what what's going on here? You see that um, Joseph Dunn like finds something and freaks. He's like, oh, I've, oh, I found it out. Yeah, and, and then, Mr. Glass does too. Yeah, so when. Um, when Joseph gets there and is going to tell the Horde Glass, like, you told him too early. Yeah. So then um, the Horde, like, punches Glass in his chest and causes him to get mortally wounded by falling out of his chair and breaking who knows how many bones and, you know, being left there to die. And then, so, like, he has a big emotional moment with his mom. And then Casey has an emotional moment with the Horde. And then this is the part to me where I was like, the way this movie is set up and all that stuff, it was very unsatisfying to me that David Dunn got drowned in a puddle. I I actually liked it because I, you know, this goes against everything superhero films. You don't traditionally do. Like, I like that it kind of, you know, I, I think... But he, like, at the end of the movie, he was it's, essentially... It's the same thing as having Luke Skywalker get killed. You know, like, I, I think the, the bigger story is the end of it of, you know, Glass succeeding and whether you think that's good or... I mean... You know, you don't you don't think anybody should be killed outright just because they're a superhero or, or whatever. But um, but I think the the final story was, you know, glass, you know, and his plan that worked um, with well, his plan. But here's the so like I said, the I don't think there was any reason for. 
well, so going for, to exist anymore. Well, my point is there was over. no there was no point for him to even to even really be in the movie yeah. because yeah. he was essentially a glorified cameo, and they killed off a character and kind of retroactively hurt the legacy of another movie. Because his I his I mean, if you so if you have it. a character whose story is completed in a prior film and you bring him into the new film just to be there and to die, like I think that's where a lot of people really came away with the sour taste in their mouth. Um, cause you know, I, I wasn't expecting it to be, cause my thing was like, so the, the group, the shamrock group or whatever it yeah. is, like David Dunn isn't a mass murderer or a villain. Well, like, I think they're the villains. That's the story. But, they are like, the villains. That's, that's, I think that's the takeaway from it. Her character is not great, but she at least, I'm, I guess was trying to convince be them more to humane be, be just more humane them. about it. But in the end of the day, you know, she was like, you know, we got to do what we got to do. But the, but the, like the other thing too, though, is you just saw him in a huge ga- uh, drum of water that he's able to use his powers to break and get out of. Yeah. And then a dude just holds his head in the pond and he's not. I able think to- that's more dramatic though, because it's, it's not like he lost against, you know, uh, the horde or anything like that. I think it just makes it more f- frustrating. And I think, which is the intention of these people are murdering him, you know, they, they're just essentially murdering him and, at his weakest point, like they're kicking him while he's down. Um, well, I think too, like I would just, this is all complete conjecture. I would assume that some of the, the less than enthusiastic performance you get from Bruce Willis in this movie could be due to him reading the script and not being super enthused with what it was and just taking the paycheck. Yeah. I wonder, I, I remember you saying that he, I felt he did all right in this film and I, I feel I mean, like, like, I think maybe like, it was an intentional the delivery beginning stuff like with him between him and his son and stuff. That was great. Yeah. Um, but then once he got to the institution, there just wasn't a lot going on there because he's a he sane, didn't have a lot to work with because he's a sane person. He's yeah. not, you know, the he's not the horde with multiple personalities. He's not glass in a catatonic state. He's just a normal dude. So the fact that there wasn't more dialogue for him or him even talking to them was a little bit frustrating. But so just to me, the way that like. They didn't even really attempt to like to talk to him more, and he was just didn't really talk to anybody. Like that was frustrating because it's like, well, he's not because it's the same thing that TV shows do all the time. Of in movies, characters have information, or they just don't interact with other characters in a way that's conducive to this. Like, because if yeah. they did, there'd be no movie. But um, it just felt frustrating a little bit. But so then you have where they've killed. Um, but he he also is not a character that you know. Mr. Glass, I feel like, did a lot of talking at him in Unbreakable. Yeah. And he was a quiet type. You know, he, I think he speaks with his fist. You know, that is his yeah. character kind of, from my memory of that film. Um, you know, he was, you know, and that's the kind of life he's lived. And, you know, he has a relationship with his son, but I, I feel like he was frustrated in there and just kind of thinking about, I don't know, I'm not really concerned with what's going on, but how am I going to get out? And then he was maybe taken aback as like questioning his own self, but not outwardly too much. You know, like they yeah. did not lean on that heavy and then um so once you have the plan that's played out of like the i guess you call them the shamrock group or whatever where they've you know the horde killed glass and then they killed the horde and david dunn um they think that they've you know won and they you know not won but their experiment failed and sarah paulson has to go to a public restaurant and tell a group of people because she has um done touch her which is kind of pointless i mean like if he's dying anyway yeah. why does it matter to I guess she wanted to give him some element of understand what's going on, but the flash that he gets when he touches her is just seeing people in a restaurant. Yeah. So I didn't really get much information. Then and they f- say, would you like more bread, sir? And then he goes, he dies. <laughs> so then you find out that what that really was, they have the secret society that's going after people that have powers. Which and if to you take miss them out. it, they show the tattoo about 30 times. But in like a, in like a one minute s- <laughs> yeah. span, they don't yeah. foreshadow that at all. You don't see it at all. But in one minute, you see it on every single person that is within a... Uh, uh, you know, 500 foot radius of, uh, of this whole, uh, showdown. So then you have that. So then, you know, it's kind of like, well, her experiment failed, but she thinks that she's ready if they, you know, the next town where there's people that have powers that she'll try to experiment again. She thinks she can work and it's a more humane option than just putting the people down. Um, which I guess like if you're an evil corporation, you're the lesser of the evils. So that's kind of a progress, but then you find out, the glass, um, like his mom and Joseph Dunn and Casey all get emails or links to the footage for, of the, from all the security cameras at the institution because glass hearing at some point that they have like hundreds of cameras that, so nothing goes unseen. He uses that against them and uses it to get footage of all this stuff and shares it. So his main plan was to reveal to the world, the people of powers do exist and you, 
kind of like a sappy, like, be your best self. Don't let people tell you you can't do it because yeah. you can. So you have that type of message. So then the video gets uploaded online. And then, like, so then you have um, his uh, Joseph Dunn and Casey and Glass's mom all go to, like, a train station. And while they're there, people start finding it and watching on their phone. And the part where that kind of fails in the modern world is at this point anything like that would not be believed believed and be would be heavily scrutinized because today you can go on YouTube and find stuff with more effects and more you know fight scenes between stuff that has better yeah, effects. Yeah, but but it's not like this is coming out of nowhere. Like uh, two of the people are you know known quantities essentially. You know what I mean? Or at least one of them. But like the overseer, I mean, like is more of like a myth type thing, yeah. but. You know, it's pretty easy to say, oh, well, you know, because it shows him bending like a bar. Yeah. And then it shows a guy running on all fours. It's like in climbing up walls and yeah. stuff. Yeah. I mean, granted, yeah, it could all be faked. But, you know, I think it, I think it's fine. I think it that's yeah. where I, that's where like, it serves the point of the story. That's where I said it would have worked a lot better in 2005. Because if that got put on YouTube when YouTube first existed or got sent to news Yeah, stations, but I mean, again, it's, it's shorthand. It's cinema shorthand. The yeah. point is, you know... Whether whether it was corroborated, you know, in, in two seconds being sent to the news stations or whatever, or ten minutes, like it's for dramatic effect. Well, glasses and I think, playing. I think the yeah the the the, the thing is, hey, I, I liked how that all played out too. You know, she's so, it is the classic. She's sitting in the comic store and she hears something and she's like, oh no, like I've been had essentially. Yeah. Because um, she and, hears and some... he alluded to that. You know, he says during the showdown, like this is an origin story, and I wondered, I was like, wait, is this is he supposed to be inspiring maybe his son or somebody else? Like, what is the origin story? So. Well, yeah, I, I like how the information was doled out, and it wasn't. So I guess it's an origin story for everyone else with powers. Yeah, um, and I think it's supposed to be kind of the rebirth of the world. And in the interview, Shyamalan had said that you know one flew over the cuckoo's nest, where it's a you know one character fulfills the arc of another character is something that he found interesting. So this movie kind of does that, and your main characters are all kind of gone. For your main characters from the prior movies are gone and yeah. it's a new generation that will carry forward which is kind of what star wars did and yeah, some other movies it's exactly what i was thinking the end but of return i would of the Jedi. say that the difference is so i think to the average moviegoer based on some of the or not the average movie, the, the average critical review so it's kind of a funny juxtaposition so the average critical reviewer seems to have reaction to this story that a lot of average moviegoers had to last jedi that the yeah. critics didn't so it kind of reversed where, because The Last Jedi, very critically well-reviewed, and then it could have been a vocal minority, but people did have problems with a lot of the elements. As opposed to this one, you have more general audience members defending it and critics that were hard on it. But I think a movie that kind of walks the balance and does that perfectly while being satisfying and fulfilling with Spider-Man in the Spider-Verse... And it's like, well, it was different. I mean, that was a completely different type of movie. Yeah, well, and not to spoil any of the even the themes of that movie, but but yeah, I mean, I th I think too. Well, just in that movie, you have a new Spider Man. Yeah, you have Miles Morales, and that wasn't something that pissed people off. Yeah. Um, for me, like I, I was also thinking this film. He he also has to work against uh, the stigma of him making one of his own films. You know, he doesn't. There has to be a so, twist. So I think you know the thing was maybe people expected that. I don't know. Maybe they expected the Sarah Paulson character to have uh, there to be some twist. Honestly, I feel like he was leading down the path. I know you said it was frustrating that these characters know these things are real. You know, you could I it crossed my mind like, oh, maybe the twist is that this was all in somebody's mind or, you know, or something like that. Like, yeah. I thought maybe the <laughs> twist was which would have been unsatisfying. Yeah. And maybe he was playing against those expectations on not all the audience members, but some of the audience members. Like, it's hard to know where where he because th I mean. With his films, you he has to have such an acute awareness of the audience when, and their reaction throughout the entire film when he's setting up certain twists. This film, he just has to be aware of um, the stigmas going in when he makes a film. And some people, if they don't get that, they're pissed off. Other times, if they if they get figured out, then people hate it because they think, oh, I'm smarter than this. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? He's, he's in a bad spot. Well, I think, and I don't think he probably ever anticipated that making some great films with some great twist was going to kind of damn him in some ways, you know? Yeah, well, he's consigned to people expecting that to come. Yeah, and which isn't so in this, frustrating So like I him. said, in this movie, I like the ending. So you get the ending. There's actually a secret society that he views, like, you know, quote-unquote heroes and villains kind of the same and just doesn't want them out there. 
And so that's like your big reveal, but you almost get no time to really sit on that and to really let that sink in before you get the next twist of Glass actually, his entire goal was just to not to get to that building in front of all the news stations to reveal this and give you the more typical superhero movie ending. But instead, it was just to get footage of them fighting around the facility and to have that be what. Which got again, it subverts your expectation because that's what you expect it too. You know, yeah. that is, as the comic book movie viewer now, like that's what you expect. Like, oh, they're going to fight on top of the building. They're going to have the ending from Spider Man 3 where there's a news camera. Yes, it's like, well, yeah. what's going on here? Exactly, exactly. And, and you think, and also too, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, oh, for budgetary reasons, they're going to have it right here and they never yeah. get over there. But then you think, oh, no, this is a plan the entire time. Like, I, I think. Whatever he had for limitations and whatever he wrote around, for me, it did not feel like it limited the film, re- well, the, really. Uh, like, um, it felt like he, for the most part, got to tell the story he wanted to. Again, I don't think execution was perfect throughout, and I think that second act felt pretty rough on the first watch. Um, parts of it felt, and I don't want to say, rough is kind of too harsh, I think. it. I felt like it wanted, I wanted to hurry it along at some parts of that two, second act. The... Like the the ending stuff, um, it, like it'd be interesting to see like how this plays over time. But like you know, you like I said, the the other thing was you didn't really get any of sense of like was was Glass aware of that there was this secret organization that was trying to take out people with powers. Like, did he have any awareness of that, or did he just knew that it was going to take too much to get that far across town? So that's why he planned it to be local. So like you don't really get any sense of whether or not he knew about this organization or if it just so happened that the way he did things beat them out anyway. Yeah, and true. his goal was always just to expose the people have powers to the world because that was his goal in the first movie. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the thing you don't know is, did he have any idea of what this organization was doing and beat them at their own game? Or was it just so happens that what his goal was won anyway? It worked out, yeah. Um, and like, and then basically he created both David. Well, he didn't really create, but he exposed like David Dunn and created the horde by drilling that train and killing um, Kevin Crumb's father. Which I think the the, the way they work in flashbacks, but sometimes you don't really want in films too much. I think the flashbacks worked great. Not only the uh, intercutting with the older footage and kind of newer stuff, but also the flashbacks of some of the character moments of Glass when he was younger, all that. I think all that worked but really well. But I saw well. somebody saying that if you were to um, cut the subplot about Glass being responsible for the death of Kevin Crumb's father, ultimately it doesn't change the movie much because they were all going to die anyway at the hands of that group. Um, but it just, you know, it, it ties into... Glass may not have died. Well, they would have I mean, killed everybody. Yeah, maybe, maybe, but you know, but still, I mean, I think it's just a, it's just a great. I think that was a satisfying little uh, connection there for me. Well, it just you know did more of the ties everything in together, yeah. and everything is more coincidence or or you know, um, tied in. Um, but yeah, I think a lot like like I said to me. So I watched this movie, and I understand that like the subverting expectations and killing off your hero character with David Dunn and the way they did it subverts expectations. But it's one of those things, too, where it's when you watch superhero movies or you watch Star Wars or you watch all these like so Star Wars, the Jedis can easily kill a thousand people at once. And some scenes and other scenes are getting hung up by one dude with the blaster. Like in this movie, the fight between the Horde and David Dunn, then you followed up where just a normal dude drowns him in a puddle doesn't seem to track all that well. I mean, he was so weak, though. You know, I think, I mean, it, it all logically worked out. You know, for me, it just felt it's like... Just, to me, it just, like I said, I think it's just an unsatisfying way to do it because you had the big... Because my thing is, like, so between the Horde or Kevin and, and the character of Casey, there's not much connection there. And they get a huge emotional payout yeah. as opposed to your more established character that has, like, their kid there. Um, but also that film was 19 years ago. Yeah. Modern audiences that are, I I walked in and there was like a bunch of, you know, I don't know, I guess they could drive, but they were younger teens. So they may have just seen split. You know what I mean? Like he may have just been like, Hey, I, you know, I don't know, but, but no, I I get that at the same time too. I I like that. It was a puddle though. You know what I mean? I love that. It was just like, he was defeated by like a puddle on the ground, like, because it is tragic. Like, Oh yeah. His weakness. He, and it, he was just drowned by just some random guy. Like that was a random that operative is brutal. whose face you never seen. That is brutal, and you just see how like kind of evil 
this corporation is or, or this society is. Um, but like, so, so my thing was, I know this is just, you know, probably too conventional, but like, so we were sitting there after the movie ended. I was like, is there like a post credit scene where David Dunn's not dead? Because then I'm going <laughs> to love this. And then I looked it up and like, oh, there's no post credit yeah. scene. It's like, well, so this just leaves me on an emotional, just kind of like, eh. Just Cause there's so many, like I said, because like I understand there's it was just a shortcut of having them put the video on the internet and everyone sees it and it has an effect. In the real world, the way things work today, stuff gets put on the internet and the next day it's old news because something even more ridiculous has taken its place. Yeah. So in to in in the current day United States, this real world that would not. Well, have it doesn't much matter if people. It doesn't matter if the if 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 it's still a news story a week later. What matters is is that it inspired like you know all these people to. Uh, believe in their self, whether they're a hero or a villain. I think. I think that well, was the the story. This it's, message is also not very inclusive towards um, nations that don't have access to adequate internet <laughs> internet infrastructure. Because how would they see the video? No, I mean, I'm just joking. But like, yeah, I mean, so it's just it was kind of a shortcut to that. You know, showing it uh, being immediately effective, as opposed to the real world. I don't think that people will be sitting in a public place and all start noticing at once. Well, I, I, I assume too. It was on the news, so news alerts. I have news alerts on my phone. I'm sure plenty of people do. CNN. Oh, these, you know, but, I mean, superhuman fight in front of the thing. Like, what? I'm checking that out. I'm definitely going to look at that right away. But, I mean, at the same time, it'd be pretty easy to dismiss as, oh, well, Elijah Glass, the criminal behind this, has been spending all his time on, you know, learning CGI yeah. and special effects and is trying to use this yeah. to push some agenda. Yeah, but I mean, I just, I, you know, it's more about the themes. It's just like Star Wars. It doesn't matter, actually. It, you know, they... They get you from A to B, and the things are logically play out, but it's all shorthand because it is about the themes more importantly than so uh, it, the minute details. So if somebody because it a, is cinema, it's it's cinema, it's not real. So life. if somebody had a lot of nits to pick with Star Wars and the way that played out, where you're more thematically than logically in some instances yeah. when you're thinking about what's actually happening, I think they'll have similar problems with this movie. You think so? Um. I mean, because I saw a lot of people complaining, mostly about, like, the David Dunn stuff Yeah. at the end. And, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, heroes do die in the real world, and it is, that does happen. Because um, I've been watching some of The Punisher on Netflix, and he kills 30 people and, yeah. and all this stuff. And, but, and I, you know, and I'm not saying, you know, there could have been a more satisfying arc for, for his character, because there really wasn't much of one. Um, and maybe that's why he was just limited. That's not the story he wanted to tell. But also... I think it was good to kill these people off if he didn't. If the story was over with with them, yeah. like I don't want to just see them alive because then people will be asking them till the end of time. When are you going to make a third or fourth one? You know what I mean? Like I think if he is done with these this story and these characters of this specific world, like yeah, you need to wipe them out because this is not this isn't a a Spider Man. You know what I mean? Like this isn't one that's going to be rebooted all the time and retold. Like this is his story. Well, the 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 characters and this is has reached the end of of end of what he wants to say he finishes it with his last kind of exclamation of like what what this world is and where it's leaving and that's it and i for me i'm like good i don't want any questions left as far as that goes because i don't need anything else from david dunn because you know i got what i wanted out of unbreakable yeah yeah and and i didn't want that film again you know yeah i mean i didn't think doing that film again would have worked yeah. i'm just saying like based on the expectations of what you're like oh you're taking the character from this and mashing yeah. up with this and then this movie not really being about this other character you brought in's arc at all. It's like, well, why would you even bring them in? Yeah. And I can see, I mean, I understand people don't like this film. For me personally, you know, it, it worked um, pretty well. And I I walked out pretty happy. Um, and also I had temp- tempered expectations going in. But, yeah, I mean, uh, I, like I said, going hearing some of the earlier reviews, I'm like, oh, is this a train wreck? And it's yeah. like, oh, it's not a train wreck. No. It just... I think if you're going at it from a standpoint of logically, people would not see a video on the internet and it would change the world overnight because we're so cynical. Like if you go from that point, then no, it's, but if you go in for more thematically what he's going for, which is like, oh, you shouldn't suppress yourself because people tell you you're not special. And yeah. then I can see, so yeah, I mean, like I see where people like it and dislike it. Um, just to me, it didn't hang super emotionally um, enjoyable or it, like it, it delivered stuff where it's like, oh, this is an interesting take on it. Yeah. Um, if there was a few things that played out differently, I would have came away a lot more positive on it. Just the way it ended, it's like, I got the message. It just feels like a very similar message to other things we've had uh-huh. lately. Yeah, for sure, for and sure. And then, um, like, I enjoyed the filmmaking of it. I enjoyed the craft. I enjoyed, you know, the performances and seeing stuff happen. 
Um, That's where a lot of it hangs for me. I love the, the you know, the, like I said, the direction, the filmmaking, and and the actors. I all enjoyed, and the this you know the themes and the things talked about were were good enough for me. You know, I didn't need some crazy world crumbling twists. Um, I felt like the the villain's plot played out very much like a typical villain plot, and you get this twist of like, oh, the villain kind of won, but also you know, it's it was interesting because the villain won, but also you know, but also he beat other villains like he is absolutely a villain and a terrorist you know what i mean but so that's like a weird way to end things both um, villains won <laughs> yeah yeah so uh yeah but i yeah i i enjoyed this film quite a bit um did not stick the landing at all at, at all points um uh, and definitely i think it, your opinions a lot of people's opinions may change on rewatches or they may just get solidified um but but I don't know if mine will get better over time. It yeah. may with that second act, or I may keep watching it and think, man, the second act drag, you know, part of this drags. I just want to skip to like maybe the middle of the second act. I mean, because like I like the work they might have done for, you know, Six Sense, Unbreakable, Signs. I even, I like The Village. Um, you know, like The Village is one where I think, you know, expectations got the better of it. People expected it to essentially be what they expected The Witch to be a couple years ago, and neither movie were what they wanted. Yeah. Um, so you know, like up, so from six cents to the village, I liked his work and I really wasn't a big fan of stuff in the middle, but then from, you know, the visit and split, I was a fan again. And this I think is more like in his second tier of work, like not, you know, the six cents or whatever, but it's also not after earth or some of these other things. So, you know, and also better I, than it's the, the critic scores would lead you to believe, but yeah, that's our opinions of it. I did not like his cameo in it though normally yeah, his cameo I'm fine. is gratuitous it, it, yeah gratuitous and we're not like okay come on we don't have much dialogue from bruce willis in this film and he's gonna sit here and like worry about exchange i know it was with the sun like i'm going for a walk but but also too because there was that dialogue about the security cameras i thought that was a little bit of a foreshadowing because they're when they're showing all the cameras going up at this at the uh institute yeah i thought oh well, is his son you know is this like a back uh, you know kind of a uh uh, underground tactic that his son is kind of helping out on or something like I thought that was going to kind of come into play because they, they getting, brought it up they're getting his son involved to have that as a threat over his head or something yeah I don't, yeah I don't know but I I thought oh well this, is this going to play out meaning like his son does have footage of all this like, yeah uh, but that never played out it's so like, it, it oh, didn't hey uh, you worked at the stadium uh, yeah it did it 17 didn't, years it ago, did not you? it did not make that cameo I thought that cameo was going to make sense because he was buying cameras and stuff it's like well, okay he, this is a reason for this character no could have totally he been often cut. over explained stuff when he's in cameo roles yeah. but in this one it was just kind of like oh he just wanted to find something to stick in there i mean it's his movie he felt self-financing he's aging he well too yeah yeah i mean he is aged very well yeah. from 2000 to yeah. 2019 but most people do except for white people <laughs> <laughs> i feel like everybody ages well but white people well it depends uh, on the ones because like paul rudd looks about the same true, now in true. halloween six that's true from Any, the 90s. anybody the irish though typically not you know i got <laughs> i'm a a lot of Irish family, uh, or, you know, Irish origins, but yeah, you look at Ron Howard and, uh, that's what I look like when I was a kid, Opie and I'm already going bald. So I'll probably look like Ron Howard here in about 10 years. <laughs> well, I mean, like in the movie, Bruce Willis doesn't look vastly different. No, no, if he's you, aged, he's aged really well if too. You, um, shave, if you shave, years? if you shave down the stubble and got rid of the white, he'd look yeah. about the same. Well, also too, I'm like this tower they're building. Is this like a, going to be some sort of weird, like, um, meta commentary on Die Hard is this the Nakatomi <laughs> Plaza because it has it Osaka that, or yeah or Osaka I was like what is going or on so with or this it was calm. Um, but then it didn't really come into but play but they specifically say the Osaka or whatever the tallest building in the city like oh, they say that multiple times and that's where they were at the end when all the news was breaking yeah yeah uh, no they, I thought they were in a uh, a train station well I thought that there were signs that had that company's name on it was it okay I assumed it was like, like a, a uh, in the like a grand, grand level I thought it was building. like a grand central station of Philadelphia or whatever because there are because they show the train they show the building and they show the train go by and they pan down to the to the front of the building it looks like a train you know like oh, a train well, and then they show the inside Well I know they had like logos of that yeah. company in there but yeah. yeah so I think that'll wrap up our discussion of glass so overall I was so happy that I didn't walk out super bummed <laughs> because after the reviews I thought man and I you know just happened to be able to carve out some time to see it. I'm really glad I did. You know, there's no giant twist that's going to be like, you know, split level of being like, oh, that would have been a great experience in theaters. But at the same time, I, you know, 
hopefully you've seen it if you listen well, this far, but um, I'm happy I saw this for sure. I think, too, we also live in not talking about political or anything like outrage culture where somebody doesn't love a movie 100%, they hate it. So yeah. you see a lot of one out of... It's less from professional critics and you see one out of tens being assigned to stuff. But you go look through like Amazon and IMDb and you see these one out of ten reviews for stuff. And it's like, this is not a one out of ten or five. Yeah, like, and you've seen people say, like there's that one article going around about, I think the... I don't know who... I don't know what publication posted it, but it was like, oh, he should get a screenwriter. And it's like, man, dude, like if he got a screenwriter, then he makes, I haven't seen it, but like say After Earth, like I don't want to see him just make a Marvel well, film. Variety was yeah. saying that he should work with the screenwriter, but the thing is though. He can work though, with one if he want, if you know, if, they, if he chooses, and I think maybe it would have benefited on some stuff. I don't know what notes he got. But, but the batting average that he has, like is, there's, there's other directors that have had just as many misses. Yeah. And aren't getting the same level of like well, especially writer directors. Well, and too, like the thing that they're overlooking is Glass is going to be a financial success. Yeah. So it's not like he's going to be taking a hit on this. If anything, this will encourage him to make something else. Yeah. Um, and I'm so, really glad he's already at least, hopefully, you know, I don't know how things work with um, when, when he's going to see his money back yeah. or how much <laughs> he will actually see with the uh, you know co-producing deals and all that stuff. Probably but, get some back end. But I hope whatever he had. He had it in blood, like, hey, I'm back in this movie. I better be getting the first $10 million. You know what I mean? After yeah. we pay for marketing costs, I better be getting my payback. Would, and then I would think between Glass, um, Split, and The Visit all being self-financed and doing very well, yeah. that he would have made his money back at this point yeah. quite yeah. handily. So but. good for him, man. I mean, that's a it's been a great comeback story. Whether or not you like this one or not, like, you know, it's a cool thing that financially he's doing all right he's at least an interesting filmmaker filmmaker yeah. now that seems like he's back into doing different projects so i am excited to see what he does next um any word on that i haven't heard anything yeah, I, really I, know. I, I know normally they don't like to talk about it until you know maybe a couple weeks out or something, knowing like the way he works he probably has like scripts in the can that are yeah. just sitting there and figuring out which one i mean to he's, do. yeah he's been working pretty hard the past few years yeah uh, since the visit Yep, so that'll wrap up our discussion of Glass. If you enjoyed this discussion, you can catch our podcast where we discuss all kinds of different movies from new releases to older movies. If you've never heard any about other stuff, so there's older podcasts. Like on our, There's a playlist on our channel that's just for the podcast episodes so you can scroll through and see all the ones we've covered. We've also done other videos about TV shows and movies and stuff and lists and short films, so check all those out if you haven't. Um, so like all that's on our, um, page. You can also go to our website at housefacestore.com. Find links there to all of our social media accounts. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, all those places. Let us know what you think of the film too. That's what I'm curious yeah, about. Yeah. In the comments, let us know what yeah. you think because, um, yeah, it's a divisive movie. So we're interested to see what some different people's thoughts on it are, but yeah. So then if you want to follow our stuff specifically on social media, you can find me on Instagram at the William Caps. And I'm at Blevin Sean on Twitter. And that'll bring our discussion of glass to a close. Thanks for watching.